So I thought I'd start uh, with a little bit around national context around integrated care. It, it's really interesting. Um, it's, it's definitely very much um, a national policy imperative. Um, there are a lot of academics writing about integrated care currently, um, and there are lots of different models being looked at um, around what does integrated care mean uh, and what can it deliver for our patients and the broader population. I think what's really interesting to say here is that there is no single view or definition about what integrated care is or how it can add some value. Um, and so I think that's really, really important that we spend a little bit of time talking about what it means here at the Royal Free and what it means here in our local health system and what patients in our population can expect as a, as, as a, a consequence of the work um, that we're trying to undertake here. Very, very huge variation in terms of um, uh, styles and approach, um, different methodologies around is it about service integration, so mapping pathways to how patients experience care, or is it about organisational integration where you actually bring hospitals and community services together um, to, to work um, in a more structurally different way. So I think we'll all be familiar with the very well publicised stories that happen all the time about what goes wrong when we don't have an integrated health system. Um, there are particular, what tends to be in terms of trends of where incidents happen or where patients feel the need to complain, it's quite often around those transitions of care where one institution stops an element of care that it's providing and another picks up um, part of that care. And for patients that is incredibly complex and confusing and actually why should it matter to them whether it's the royal free providing an element of care or whether it's their GP. Actually, our patients have a right to expect the right care in the right place at the right time by clinicians who are appropriately qualified and who are going to be nice and respectful to them. And actually all the rest in terms of how we manage the system and how we manage um, the dependencies across different services should be stuff that we manage behind the scenes so all the patients experience is a more seamless pathway of care. I think there's another really important factor within here that clearly you'll all be very aware of the, the economic environment that we find ourselves in and of course just as um, the economy in this country heads out of recession, traditionally that's when the public sector heads in um, to, to a period of austerity. Um, and we are heading into, uh, well we are already in it, but certainly um, heading for probably at least the next 10 years um, of um, a very constrained um, uh, budget for the NHS. Um, so whilst in absolute terms, um, all of the uh, announcements that have been made that in real terms uh, the NHS budget will not be cut, what we have to do is absorb increasing demand through population growth, through um, changes in medical technologies, uh, through um, the effects of a progressively um, uh, getting older population, so uh, life expectancy increasing. We have to manage all of those increases in demand within that existing envelope um, of financial resources. And so what that actually means uh, is in real terms we have to, as an NHS nationally, make at least £20 billion worth of savings, that's about 20% of the budget, um, over the next five, five years. Um, so this won't happen through a little bit of incremental change. We actually really need to start again and think through the patient's eyes about how is it best to deliver um, patient pathways and, and systems of care um, across local health and social care communities. So in terms of more of our local um, context, we have a very mixed health economy here. Um, I, I'm sure you've heard this before, but the Royal Free is really essentially two organisations in one. So we have about half of our organisation, which is specialist services being provided to a very large population, some regionally, some nationally, some internationally. And then we have about half of our organisation which is providing local district general hospital services to the population of North Camden and South Barnet essentially. We are now starting to see increasing patient flows coming from the eastern part of Brent, um, largely driven by um, some of the consequences of the changes um, at the central Middlesex, but, um, uh, but primarily it's North Camden and South Barnet and actually they have very different populations. Uh, clearly there's a lot of commonality in terms of some of the long-term conditions that, that are faced but actually South Barnet is, is a very interesting population because it has a very high density of care homes within it. In fact there are 120 care homes in Barnet 
um, which is an extraordinary level, a lot of those are in South Barnet. Um, and so therefore, uh, we have um, a relatively speaking uh, complex elderly population that those needs need to be met for South Barnet, which is, um, although there are those needs in North Camden, there is in North Camden a younger population. There's more significant um, prevalence of things like acute mental health problems, drug and substance misuse. Um, and we need to make sure that we can respond to all of those um, types of uh, uh, patients and their needs um, in an appropriate way. So that, that's in terms of our demographics. Um, if you overlay on that, um, that we are in a system where Barnet Clinical Commissioning Group, which is one of the organisations that purchases um, healthcare um, uh, on behalf of our patients uh, for our hospital, it is the most financially challenged commissioning organisation in England. Um, it has the worst financial problems, um, it has the worst historic debt problems, um, and um, they're, they're complex and multifaceted, but that, that's the situation we find ourselves in. Relatively to Camden, which um, is a, a financially strong organisation, um, it, it will uh, experience challenges as a result of the, the, the national context I explained to you, um, but they are very different commissioning conversations we have with Camden um, than with Barnet in terms of how we can provide the services. What's important for us there is because what we can't accept is a, a, a return of what people have sometimes termed as a postcode lottery. So actually what we want to do is create um, pathways and systems of care for our patients that are consistent um, uh, regardless of where you live. And therefore what we need to do through integration is try wherever we can to eliminate the waste or duplication um, in the system to be able to deliver the very best in terms of patient outcomes patient experience, but also value for money for, for all of us as taxpayers. Um, I think another thing to say here in terms of so um, wh what's different about our approach to integrated care here is we've spent a lot of time working very closely with all of our fellow partners um, across the health and social care system. So we have incredibly good relationships with GPs. Um, both as providers but also in their roles as clinical commissioners within the cl clinical commissioning groups. Um, and that's, that's hard work. It takes a lot of work to work with so many different practices that we deal with to make sure that we are able to give them what they need to be able to manage and coordinate the care of their patients in the most appropriate way. Um, we also have very good relationships with our community providers um, and the mental health trusts complex here because we work with two of each um, so we're not coterminous so we have uh, a community provider that serves Barnet and a community provider that serves Camden um, they're parts of very different organizations that have different um, priorities in, in, in terms of the direction of their services two mental health trusts again very different organizations serving very different populations with different needs two London boroughs so two social care systems um, uh, again differing visions different priorities uh, and we also work with quite a wide range of third sector and voluntary organisations now. So, so it's quite a, a, a complex dynamic, but there is a high degree of alignment. We've spent a lot of time trying to articulate the shared uh, answer to the what's in it for me question, if you like. Being really, really clear about actually how we can focus our energies on delivering outcomes that will improve um, uh, the experience and outcomes for patients whilst being able to further um, what each of those organisations and stakeholders needs to deliver. And the last thing I'd say is around track record um, to date. We, we've not been, um, uh, we're not new to this. Uh, although probably it's been over the last 18 months or so, there's been a real focus nationally around integrated care. Um, the board of this organisation had a very clear vision um, back before I arrived in the organisation that it really wanted to uh, create essentially an organisation without walls, one that was driven by focusing services around patients rather than institutions, uh, one that was seen as a mature um, partner uh, within the local health and social care system to solve some of these problems that we collectively have. So that's all well and good. What does it actually mean in practice? So I think uh, what I said to you at the start was lots of different definitions, lots of different uh, opinions about what integrated care is and what it does. So what I'd say here is that this isn't a little hobby that me and a couple of other enthusiasts sit in a darkened room and work on. This is absolutely central um, to our vision and our mission um, as an organisation. It's one of our strategic imperatives um, in terms of our business plan um, and it's one of the real fundamental service developments um, that we have in terms of our uh, sort of strategic portfolio, if you like.
Um, we spent quite a long time defining what integrated care was for us specifically so that we could make sure that we could focus our energies in the right place. So it needs to do one, one or a combination of these three things. So the first one is pretty um, undisputed. So it needs to improve patient experience. That has to be at the heart of any integrated care work that we do. Um, it's relatively undisputed. Um, there is a, a common view that actually if you integrate care properly, it improves patient experience because it takes a lot of fragmentation and, and hassle and difficulty, if you like, for, for patients. Um, so it has to enhance patient experience and then it has to do one of these two other things. So at the moment, um, there are patients that arrive in our services because there's nowhere else for them to go whether it be a place of safety or whether it's because actually other systems or services have broken down, but there are groups of patients here um, who are here because there's nowhere else, there's no other option, and that's not good care. It's not the right thing for patients and it actually doesn't give a um, good experience or, or deliver the best outcomes. So through integration with our partners, if we can create different pathways that actually avoid patients who don't clinically need to be in a hospital environment from being here, that's one of the things that we actively look to progress within integrated care. And the, the, same, the same applies in terms of the unnecessary. So there are some care that actually could be delivered um, in another environment or another setting. Um, and actually that those are the types of things that we'd look at from an integrated care perspective. The other thing is, actually, if it's not about avoiding clinically inappropriate or unnecessary activity, it also helps us to um, enable more sustainable um, solutions for activity that is either unavoidable, so that it's not necessarily patients that need to be in an acute hospital environment, but actually they do need to be in a place of safety for whatever reason, um, or um, clinically appropriate, so activity that we, we should be undertaking, um, but actually it helps us to do it in a more patient-centred way in the most appropriate care setting with the right clinicians um, caring for the patient at the right point in time in that pathway. Does that kind of make sense? I know it's a little bit jargony, but there, there's those um, things really in terms of where we would focus our attentions. Otherwise, we would just get diluted and do an awful lot of things and not do them desperately well. So, so that's why we try and focus the work that we do. Okay, so um, we've talked about the, the strategy that we have here and how central it is. In terms of what we mean, these acronyms, I will explain um, what they are, but it would have been a very long slide if I put all of those um, down in full. So we have three main, three, uh, three main themes uh, that, that we look at within integrated care. One is productivity, uh, and I'm going to talk in detail about a case study of what we mean by productivity and, and, and what that looks like um, in terms of a patient journey. Um, so LOS is length of stay. So at the moment, we know in hospitals, there's been a lot of publicity about this, that patients stay in hospital far longer than they, they should. And actually what we know is for particularly certain groups of patients, they don't do well the longer they stay in hospital. Um, it, it's far better to get patients um, in an environment much closer to home as, long, as soon as they don't need to be under the 24-hour supervision of a hospital because they will recover much more quickly. There's a lot of evidence around that. Uh, new to follow up is the next one. So actually, at the moment, we have lots of patients, and uh, some of you may have experienced this, where you have to keep coming up endlessly to the hospital every six months or every year. Um, and when you get there, you have to wait you know, a couple of hours because the clinic's running late. And when you get in there, you probably have a 30-second conversation with someone that says, you're fine, see you in a year, that, that type of thing. And we have lots of those types of experiences at the moment. So what we want to do is work with patients to try and uh, provide um, better pathways of care that give them the assurance that their care needs are being met and they're being monitored appropriately, but actually we're not dragging people unnecessarily up to appointments they don't need to, they don't need to attend. Just with that, how... My son's disabled and it's like you say, we, we drag him up here every six months. We yeah. spend six hours maybe, yeah. you know, five hours, and he's seen for a very, a very short amount of time. But we're, we're, we're terrified of not making them because mm. he will be discharged back to his yeah. GP and yeah. then you, you re referral. Will that change? Mm. So, so if a patient should be discharged, because actually, you, so for example, a, a classic um, example of a pathway is there are some of our surgeons here that want to continue to see their patients after an elective surgical procedure. So a straightforward surgical procedure, they keep bringing them back year after year after year. That kind of thing, the patient should be discharged. And actually, if there is a problem, they could be re-referred. 
back up. But for situations more like the, the one you're describing, actually we could alternate follow-up appointments with, say, um, Skype or you know, video conferencing in a GP surgery or telephone clinics where someone is phoning to talk through with you what your situation is and are there any changes and do you have any concerns. Um, there are a whole way, different way um, that, that we can look at to manage um, uh, patient pathways and manage respecting individual needs rather than just having a one-size-fits-nobody um, approach. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, so the next title is a very unattractive um, term, demand management, but uh, uh, it, it's difficult to come up with a, a better solution. So what we mean by this, so POLKI is one example, to, again, terrible um, name, but it, what that stands for is Procedures of Limited Clinical Effectiveness. So an organisation called NICE, which you may have heard of, which is a national organisation which assesses the evidence base for particular drugs or procedures, has determined a range of procedures that have historically been done in the NHS, of which there is little or no evidence that they actually improve um, outcomes uh, for patients. Um, and so rather than actually um, just have a system in place which is led from a commissioning organisation remotely um, around just saying these, these patients are no longer eligible for these types of procedures, we've preferred to take an integrated approach working with primary care colleagues, GPs and, and others and our consultants to work out actually how we can work with patients to manage both their expectations but also make sure they get the clinically appropriate care um, at the right time. The important thing about this, the reason why it's part of our integrated care strategy is that it's not one part of the system doing something to another part of the system. Actually, we're taking it as a shared responsibility um, and agreeing shared approaches and responses to, to challenges that, that we have. Um, PBR excluded drugs. PBR just stands for payment by results. It's just the payment mechanism that, that through which hospitals um, are paid um, across the NHS. Um, but this really is, is talking about very high cost drugs for very rare or complex conditions, um, which uh, we are working with primary care colleagues and commissioning colleagues to make sure that patients are getting the most clinically appropriate treatment at, at the appropriate time. What has tended to happen historically is um, we would do something in isolation. We would then have to go through a very complex and convoluted uh, funding approval process, which could sometimes take six to 12 months. All the while, the patient is stuck in the middle thinking that they need a treatment but not able to access it because no one's approved the funding. Um, and the poor patient gets lost in the middle of these types of things. So the, the integrated care approach we've taken is and we've agreed um, actually you know, the various different processes that can be followed so we don't have to go through those very long, arduous um, funding mechanisms. Um, and then pathway development. Again, we're going to come on to um, uh, describe in more detail some of the work that we're doing because I think it's, it's much better to talk to you about real examples and how that impacts on patients rather than talking in theory and concept. But when we talk about pathways, that really nationally is what people talk about the most when they talk about integrated care. Um, we've already touched on the importance of relationships. I think, you know, there, there's no magic wand that you can wave. There's no thing that you can lift off the shelf and say, right, if you implement this in every health system across the country, we've all done integrated care. Um, it's about relationships and, and working out, actually, the existing services that you have in place and how you can complement them um, with, the, with the new work that you undertake. Okay, um, so I think the approach we've taken here is, is like that, really. Um, what's absolutely clear is that there isn't an evidence base for everything that we try to do around integrated care. Um, it, it quite simply doesn't exist because we're doing new things that haven't been tried um, in the NHS before or, or actually in internationally comparable um, environments. What we do know is that the current system is, is not sustainable. Um, we know that you know, patients' experience is poor in some areas because of this um, you know, fragmented system that we have. We know there's massive inefficiency between different institutions through duplication of effort, or worse still, everybody assumes someone else is doing it, and actually the patient gets lost um, in the middle. So what we do, actually, is if there is a high degree of consensus among clinicians that this is the right thing to do by patients, we test it, we work with patients in the design phase, and then, then, then we try things at a small scale. We evaluate them to death um, and continue to refine those clinical models um, until we think we've got the optimum model. Um, so we create the evidence base, if you like, as we go. 
Whereas other parts of the country, you'll see huge um, uh, energy being put into sort of evaluating very small scale projects um, that are reliant on you know, massive investment around IT um, or very different contractual mechanisms and, and therefore the actual... So, so how is it different for Mrs Jones? You know, for us, that's the, the, that's the reality check we apply all the time. If we start getting bogged down in all the you know, bureaucratic stuff, I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but I mean in, in a necessary way of managing um, across a very large system like the NHS. If we get bogged down in that, we can find six months have gone by and nothing is different for Mrs Jones. And actually for us, the important thing is actually how can we make things different and better um, for Mrs Jones. So, so we're a bit of a doer. Um, and so it, when you see other systems, you know, being published and, and all that kind of stuff, we've taken a conscious decision here that actually any kind of extra, extra sort of external publicity we do around integrated care is less time for us to spend with our patients and our clinicians in trying to pr improve the services that we have here. Um, so I'm not expecting you to see that, so don't throw up your hands in horror and say, oh gosh, I can't see that, but this is the point really. So I think in, in the title of the presentation, it's so why is it important? This is absolutely why it's important. So this is a real family. This is a real Camden family um, in, in one of the practices. The names are all different, so don't, you know, I haven't you know, been breaching patient confidentiality. But this was an exercise that was undertaken by one of our local practices to map, map the current system of care. Um, now this is three generations of a family and you can actually, if you could read the detail, you could see directly as a consequence of fragmentation in services experienced by that first generation, it's directly led to the consequences of what then happens in the second generation and then what has then happened in the third um, generation. And all of these dots are contact points or interventions with particular organisations, both health and social care. Um, and you can see, it's, it's how on earth is a patient supposed to navigate through that? And how on earth, actually, when a patient is vulnerable, um, supposed to be able to um, manage and see a, a sensible way through that? So forget the value for money argument. Forget all the stuff around you know, the, the, national, the, the national imperative. This is, this is what we're passionate about here. This is just wrong. It's the wrong thing to do by patients. And so that's what really drives us to try and um, improve what we do around integrated care. I've got another example here, um, again, a real patient. Um, this is the current system, well, it's not now because we've changed it, but this was the current system of care. So this is a, a, a reasonably common occurrence, you know, a, a patient that is getting older, um, what we call complex comorbidities, which just means there's several conditions um, that they suffer from. And just in a year, that's, that's their experience of um, the health system. So you probably can't read some of it, but if you just look, planned acute, so that's hospital visits, 14 um, in the space of a year. Um, unplanned acute, we can't map all of that, but numerous. GP, 15 unplanned home visits, 12 appointments, and then all of those interactions with the community service. How on earth is that patient supposed to be able to um, navigate their way through what such a complex and fragmented system of care? So we're trying to put this right uh, for Mrs A, so that actually what she can do is, is have a, you know, a single person who is sort of managing her care, coordinating all of this complexity for her so that she can just worry about um, her condition and, and feeling as well as she can. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. I think I've gone on. You can tell, you can tell this is really um, important to us. So, so let's talk a little bit around pathways for a second. So we have a very big programme here around um, pathway development. What we mean about pathways, so we, 35 pathways we have under development, 13 already have patients under care. Um, there are some that you'll be familiar with, so there are some that we call disease specific, so we have things like diabetes pathways, heart failure pathways, um, respiratory uh, failure pathways, um, those types of things. We have ophthalmology, gynaecology as well, so you know, um, uh, not just those sort of long-term condition ones. But we recognise very clearly that patients don't sit in neat and tidy boxes of we can put them into a diabetes pathway because they just have diabetes and nothing else. Um, and actually that can make a system more fragmented um, if you have, right, you go through this system for your diabetes but you go through that system for your heart failure or you go through the other system for, for, for your breathing problems. Um, so we also have a focus um, on what we call patient cohort specific. So one of those would be our complex frail elderly patients. 
Um, so that's kind of like Mrs A that we just looked at there. We recognise that actually they will have multiple um, conditions that at different points in time will either be the sort of predominant factor or a lesser factor. And actually what we need to do is create services that actually meet that, meet that individual's needs in their totality rather than just look at, look at one part of their care. So we have, a whole, we have a frailty pathway and a whole set of services that are actually looking at um, those types of patients with those complex um, comorbidities. So some have a focus on chronic long-term condition management. And actually, if you look elsewhere in the NHS, a lot of these national de definitions would say that integrated care is about long-term conditions and about frailty, which of course it is. But we don't constrain ourselves by that. We've actually done a lot of integrated care work along other what we'd call higher volume, lower acuity pathways, uh, which one of which I'll talk to you about um, a little bit later. But those kind of patients that actually um, could uh, very suitably have um, some diagnostics and interventions all in one place at one time, rather than having to come to five or six separate appointments one after the other. Um, we could manage um, all of those um, uh, diagnostics in one place. The patient would then see the consultant straight after those tests. So in one day, you have all your investigations and your diagnosis and your onward management plan rather than something that would currently take six months plus in terms of your initial appointment then all your tests then your follow-up so um, that's what we mean in terms of those other pathways the important thing is that all of this work delivers a change in service through integration with partners so with integrated care, this is not something we do to people. It's not something we do to patients. It's not an end. We don't say we have delivered integrated care. It's more of a method, a method that we use, a methodology, a way we engage with other people who are involved in some aspect of meeting the needs of a particular patient um, to enable a different pathway of care. So we're not interested in looking at improving pathways of care just from the moment the patient walks through the front door and then stopping when they leave the front door. What we want to do is design services through the patient's eyes. So, so right from the point that the patient um, realises they may have a problem sat in their own living room at home, um, right the way through the GP um, process and consultation through to acute services and then back out um, uh, in, into their, their, their living room again. So I want to talk to you about a specific example, and it's a service called PACE, which stands for Post-Acute Care Enablement. So I'm going to talk through this pathway really in a little bit of detail and describe the process to get us to the point um, we are now around the service, um, just because I think it's important because it brings alive everything that um, we've been talking about so far. So as I say, it stands for Post-Acute Care um, Enablement, and what this means is actually it's for a group of patients who um, have, a, have a, a genuine acute medical need that brings them to hospitals. So they are patients that require some sort of consultant opinion, probably some diagnostics and tests, and some on ongoing treatment. Um, so th those patients could either be uh, emergency through A&E department or um, booked patients that come in for different types of procedures. So they do require some sort of hospital intervention, but very soon after that hospital intervention, they can have the rest of the, um, their recovery, the rest of their post-acute phase, if you like, um, delivered for them in a more, more suitable environment, whether that's their own home, whether it's in a nursing or care home, if that's where they live. Um, but actually, it's about tailoring a, a, a package of ongoing care, if you like, around the patient uh, in an environment that's more suitable for them. The important thing is this is not a patient that's being discharged. So you will have heard of hospital at home schemes or early discharge schemes in other hospitals. Um, these patients aren't discharged. They still remain under the responsibility and management of the consultants here in this hospital. Uh, and that, that makes it a very different service because actually it means that there is rapid um, access to expert opinion. Um, if the patient you know, is not doing as well as was expected in a home-based environment, and there are very senior clinicians both in the community and in the hospital who are overseeing and coordinating um, this patient's ongoing care. Um, we have on-site case finders. What we call this is it's a pull system rather than a push. So the traditional system in the NHS is a hospital may decide the patient's ready to complete an episode of care somewhere else. They'll do a referral, which is probably paper-based. They'll send it through a fax or, you know, phone a referral through. Um, the person at the other end will then probably have to do some assessment, which may take 24 or 48 hours to undertake. They'll then determine whether or not they agree, um, and then we'll have to plan for discharge, which can lead to three or four days delay uh, in terms of a patient going home. And as we know, particularly with certain groups of patients, three or four days 
when you don't need to be in hospital is a long time and plenty of time to pick up you know some sort of infection or become less mobile or have a fall or you know or at least at the very least have not good sleep because you've got noisy neighbors and, and all of that type of thing um, so we have on-site senior community clinicians here that work with our consultants on a daily basis to actually go through every single patient that comes in and identify those patients that would be clinically appropriate for PACE. Um, it's optional, so the patient um, decides. If they don't want to go home on PACE um, early, they don't have to. They can stay in hospital, but actually, very rarely do people not um, elect uh, to go home with the PACE service. Um, so from, I think this is the other important thing, from the point at which um, a clinical decision is made that that patient is appropriate to go home with a PACE service, that patient is home within four hours, seven days a week. So this is not a Monday to Friday, nine to five type service. It, it runs up until 10 o'clock at night um, and seven days a week. So that actually means that we can respond to patients' needs much more rapidly um, than in a traditional type of model. So the patients are uh, actively identified. Another thing in more traditional ways of doing things is actually if the patient has some social care needs, so some personal care needs, um, or they need um, assistance with equipment or, or adaptations in their home environment, um, current, the, currently the system is that we have to make a referral called something that's called a Section 2, um, and social care have 72 hours with which to respond, um, and then the assessment's <coughs> undertaken, and then we plan for the patient's discharge. So that can bring about a delay of about five days. What we've agreed with social care colleagues um, is that actually community services can do the social care assessment, so it doesn't delay the patient at all. If the patient's clinically appropriate for PACE, they go home. Community services can directly access social care packages of care if they're needed, so there's no delay, um, no um, uh, you know, inappropriate um, uh, stay in a hospital uh, on the basis of social care needs. That all just happens. Um, they're easy words to say, but boy, is that making a profound difference in terms of how patients experience care, but also for, for clinicians, the amount of time that is taken in the more traditional way of completing multiple forms, getting them sent through, getting a response, and, and, and all of that kind of stuff. So, so, so that, uh, that has made a massive change. Um, the content of care is more medical and intensive, so um, we've got uh, an example of a type of patient pathway, but there is some sort of acute need, so quite often there would be a need for some intravenous fluids or antibiotics or other drugs, um, wound management, drain management, catheter management, um, you know, close observation, blood monitoring, tho those types of things um, that, that are needed for that patient. And I, I said earlier on it's a methodology rather than an off-the-shelf thing. So I just wanted to touch on this. So this is this is illustrative. Oh, I can't speak. Ill illustrative rather than actual in terms of a graph. So when we went right back to the start with our development around pace, we looked at length of stay because that's one of the mechanisms to say we have um, best practice benchmarks around length of stay. What what should it be for particular conditions and groups of patients? Um, and actually, for a hospital, what you'd like to see in an ideal world is the blue curve. So you'd have very few patients that are coming in and not staying for very long at all because actually that meant they probably shouldn't have been in hospital in the first place and we got, we got the pathway pre-hospital wrong. Um, and then you want pa the majority of patients to stay a short period of time and it rapidly tail off so you've only got relatively few patients with extremely complex needs that need to be in hospital for a long time. And that's driven purely by the fact that we know that if, if a patient doesn't clinically need to be in a hospital bed, it's not a good place for them to be. What happens in practice, and I've done this work across seven acute trusts now, what happens in practice is much more like the red curve. Um, and so you have, much, you have large groups of patients that have a much longer length of stay than is clinically necessary. Um, and so what we did when we started our pace work is we plotted um, against you know, where we should be on length of stay to identify where patients were staying longer um, than they needed to. And we found two things. Um, we found that two large groups of patients that were staying longer than they needed to were um, patients who came in with non-elective orthopaedic problems, so things like broken hips, um, you know, falling over broken elbows that needed fixing, that type of thing. And the second was a group of um, patients that were admitted under uh, our health services for elderly people, um, so acute emergency admissions for those patients um, who are more frail with complex needs. So when we did further analysis, we found that the orthopaedic patients um, was more internal process issues, so delays in getting patients to theatre and all that kind of stuff. So, so we, we've picked that up, but it wasn't something that we prioritised for integrated care work. We, we picked that up through our internal processes. 
But for the frail elderly um, work, this was entirely appropriate um, to, to explore in much more detail with our community and social care colleagues. And so that's really what, what drove us to do the development work. Um, so we touched on this. So where does PACE act? So it either acts in, in the example we, we talked about earlier, that actually patients um, come into A&E, um, they need a consultant assessment, they probably need some initial diagnostics, um, um, but then actually their ongoing care can be managed at home. So we do discharge people on PACE straight from um, A&E or from George Quist, which is our clinical observation area um, that, that is next to, um, next to our A&E department or from what we'd call the base ward. So someone maybe who's come in for an elective procedure, um, classically something like a hip replacement or something like that, but actually uh, that's not a good example actually because there are fantastic pathways around um, elective orthopaedics anyway, but, but maybe a, a colorectal, you know, a, a part of a bowel resection or something like that, um, that actually as soon as they're surgically stable, we can manage their ongoing um, needs um, in a home-based environment. So this is one, um, one example, apologies for those of you who have a slightly delicate constitution, but actually it's such a good um, example, um, we, I wanted to use, use it. So a very common um, group of patients that come into hospital, particularly seasonally, so lots in the summer, are, are quite complex elderly patients. They've become dehydrated, they've then become faecally impacted, so more than constipation, they, 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 they've become um, faecally impacted. That causes urinary problems, so quite often people will get a urinary tract infection um, and they may go into retention, so having trouble um, passing urine. Um, so they can quite often come in really quite um, unwell um, and uh, what would have happened in an old pathway is that patient would have been assessed, they'd have had some intravenous fluids started, they'd have had some intravenous antibiotics started, they'd have had a catheter inserted, they'd then have to have enemas over a period of several days to resolve the problem, then they'd need a trial without catheter and if that was successful they then go home. That's about a five day length of stay. Um, for uh, a very frail, vulnerable, um, older person. That pathway now with PACE in place is the patient is assessed in A&E, the first bag of fluids is initiated, the first dose of antibiotics is given, um, the catheter is inserted and the patient goes home in four hours with, with the PACE service. The PACE team manage all of the ongoing intravenous needs, they look after the catheter, they do um, the, uh, the enemas to resolve the problem, they do the trial without catheter and if that's successful the patient is then discharge from the PACE service. Throughout all of that pathway, uh, the community clinicians are in regular contact with the consultants here to make sure that the patient um, is uh, responding in the way that's anticipated. If they don't, um, there is telephone advice, um, but also we have what we call hot clinics. So there are seven days a week consultant-led clinics in our A&E department that the patients can come back in um, to, be, to have consultant review, not a junior doctor, not an A&E doctor, but a consultant geriatrician will review that patient there and then um, and either adjust the treatment plan for them to be able to go back home or if they need to come in, they can be admitted to hospital and they don't go through an A&E pathway, they can be um, admitted directly um, onto a ward um, as a consequence of that. Um, so in terms of the clinical model, we've talked um, quite a bit around this. I think the important thing to emphasise is this is a truly multidisciplinary team. So we have um, staff working from five different organisations working in our PACE service. So um, us, two community providers, two social care providers, but they all see themselves as part of the Royal Free PACE team. Um, you would, as a patient, not have any idea which organisation those people are employed by because they operate to a shared service model and, and it's a common set of patients. We talked about the pulling system, we talked about the assessment and the fact that the patient goes home in four hours um, and the social care piece. The, the question was uh, patients having to come back into hospital um, because the appropriate community services weren't in place to, to manage their ongoing needs. So, so yes is the answer because we, um, we commission the community providers to provide all of the care needs for these patients. So these are increased um, community services staff um, that are in place to meet the needs of these patients. If at the end of a PACE episode, they still require community intervention, they are automatically and seamlessly transferred into mainstream community services. Uh, and that's part of the agreement. So that therefore we never have patients being blocked or having to be bounced back into hospital. The only reason a patient would come back into hospital is if their clinical condition had changed and they needed to come in to have hospital supervision. This is a short video, um, which is some of the clinicians um, who deliver the PACE service telling you in their own words um, uh, what the PACE service means. 
There is, um, if you start to get confused, there is a, um, a Croydon community health services person in here thinking, oh, well, this, I've gone completely mad. Um, this video was taken early on in the pilot phase of this programme and we were one of two pilots and Croydon uh, was another pilot um, and so they wanted to just get commentary from both of the pilot sites, so, so that's all. So I'm hoping this will work. PACE is post-acute care enablement. It is a service that provides help with getting patients out from the hospital as soon as they are medically stable and then other services can be provided at home. The patients really still have uh, an ongoing acute medical and nursing needs uh, but these could be met safely in the community and the patients no longer need to be in a 24-hour monitored acute medical center. The patient is medically stable for the yeah, medical stable. Medically yeah. stable. Okay. So I think we'll just put her there. With this patient, we, we treat them as if they're still in the hospital by providing them with all the necessary carers. It can be services that are shows of the medical side or as well as therapeutic side which require nursing, it can require occupational therapies, it can require a physiotherapist as well. You give the patients genuine choice because a lot of patients actually don't want to be in the hospital. They would rather have care if they can be delivered to the same quality and standards in an acute setting. They would rather receive it at home. So all the benefits getting from the hospital, they're getting it in their own environment. In the past, we very much work in silos. The acute trust, we just discharge the patient and we don't really know what goes on. We just discharge them to district nurses, okay, and we will let the GPs sort a lot of things out. But now we have lots of meetings with our community colleagues and so we really have a very truly integrated model of care. We actually work hand in hand with the members of staff in the community. So we are one big organization. The patient then goes through a very seamless health system from primary care to secondary care. Patient when it's actually unwell, they come to the hospital. There's a medical actually sort of team in the hospital that get the patient stable. We actually sort of get the consent of the medical team and that the patient is medically stable, which means how his or her well-being can be looked after at home rather than in the hospital. After we assess the patient and confirm that they are suitable to go home with PACE team, um, then we will link in with the PACE finder. I, as a PACE find, case finder, I go there, assess the patients and see that if they are suitable to make sure that the patients are saved to be managed in the community. We will have to get the discharge summary done which is faxed to the GP straight away to inform that the patient is going out with the PACE team. We have to get transport ready and also to get the medication ready within a very short time which is about two hours turnaround time for us. So it is actually a service that is safe, it is a service that is effective it is a service that's worth investing into. I think PACE is genuinely the model of the future. It is important that we can definitely share very scarce resource between the primary and secondary care. It's good for the hospital because um, since PACE has started, uh, we can see that we are actually saving the bed. We are freeing the bed for patients that are really, really on, unstable. It will help the hospital to reduce the number of acute admission because the PACE uh, process can be applied down in A&E to support our admission avoidance um, uh, team there and also it will allow us to reduce our length of stay. It's bringing all the services together to actually benefit the patient which is actually sort of the most important thing. There's a big piece of work we are doing at the moment to improve timely discharge to make sure people can go earlier in the day. In terms of PACE patients specifically, um, the waiting time to get them home is shorter and the services are configured in that way to, to, to make it shorter because actually the patient is not being discharged. We're trying to manage their ongoing um, acute needs 
in another environment which is safer and more clinically appropriate for them. So the way the medical teams are, are geared up, the way that the support services are geared up is different. Um, so for example, uh, we, don't want, um, we, could, we could spend the whole evening talking about the reasons why people wait too long to be discharged, but one of the significant um, areas is having to wait for the medical team to write up a discharge summary and a, a prescription to take home. Uh, and that's because a decision is made on a ward round that you can go home, but it's normally once that ward round is completed that junior doctors will come back and write those um, forms, and then they have to go down to pharmacy, and then they have to come back. Um, the actual turnaround for drugs in pharmacy is 45 minutes, so it's not long. It's all the other um, uh, bits of process that create all of the delays. So it, it's not a two-tier service. It's because these patients are still and they're still in a clinical pathway um, that actually we're having to make sure that we gear up all of the appropriate things that they need to manage that continuing pathway in the home environment quickly so we can, we can get them home. Um, this was just for those of you who like numbers just to um, show you some of the figures. So um, uh, what, we, what we use as measures is at clinical outcomes um, for patients, uh, patient experience and value for money. So what we've got here, patient experience, patient satisfaction is, is very high. We continually um, uh, evaluate uh, patient satisfaction, so it's not something we do as on a spot basis a couple of times a year. We, we do it continuously. Um, and patients extremely satisfied or satisfied with the services well above 95% continually. Um, in terms of our length of stay reduction, which is actually one of the measures around clinical outcomes, because if patients stay less time um, in hospital, and then the other measure we look at within that is how many of them are readmitted. Um, so we look at those two things together to make sure that we've got it right in terms of the patients that we, we um, uh, transfer home on a pay service, that they don't come bouncing back into hospital. Um, so length of stay um, has reduced on average three days per patient and actually um, we've got some data further on um, here which shows you some even more striking changes. Readmissions are sitting at three and a half percent which uh, for that cohort of patients previous to pay service um, being implemented was, was between 21 and 25 percent. So big reduction um, in readmissions which is, which is a, a real improvement in outcomes for, for that patient group. In terms of value for money, what, what it's enabled us to do um, is we, how this works in financial terms is that we pay um, the community providers who um, also have uh, access to social care um, uh, resources, which we then pay for, um, to provide um, the care for this group of patients. That's enabled us to use 24 less beds um, for these groups of patients than we were previously. Um, so those beds are now used for different patient groups. Um, so one example is we are now the hub for complex vascular um, patients and actually those beds have been, have, have been used for patients that absolutely need, do need that 24-7 supervision in a hospital environment. Um, and actually what that enables us to do is reuse those beds, but actually it's more cost effective um, for us also to provide um, better clinical outcomes, better patient experience in a home-based environment. So that, that's, how this, that's how this model works. Um, that's, you can't see, it's just more data from the first 12 months and shows, shows you some of the cl clinical conditions and what the length of stay reduction has been. Um, you can see um, the drops in length of stay since PACE has started. This is at a total level, so this is non-elective admissions. Um, this is not just PACE patients. So for PACE patients to have brought down the total length of stay for all of those patients, of which PACE is only a small subset, it, it's been very significant in terms of um, that process. One of the ones that's most striking, I think, is the difference between Barnet and Camden and then Brent. So we don't have a, a, a PACE service relating to Brent at the moment because the patient flows that we have coming in from Brent are relatively new um, and, and the way that a PACE model works is where you have a sufficient volume of patients to be able to set up um, the infrastructure around this type of service. And you can see there's a hugely marked difference um, between, this is for comparable patients, so patients being admitted with the same conditions, it's five days longer essentially um, for Brent patients than it is Barnet. This is obviously unacceptable from a, a patient experience point of view, so we are in the process of setting up and rolling out a Brent service, but I just think it's helpful to see in terms of the historical data the impact and difference that, that PACE is having. Okay, um, this just describes really very briefly where PACE sits in our um, sort of non-elective pathway. Um, and I'll talk a, a little bit about some, some more of the um, 
uh, initiatives that we have within here. Um, but for those of you who um, are patients of the Royal Free, you'll recognise that actually what happens is you come into A&E, um, you'll either be seen in the urgent care centre or you'll be seen in the A&E department. You may go to our CDU, which is our George Quist, which is our clinical decision unit, which we talked about earlier. Um, PACE can operate at any part of that pathway and the patient, if they're clinically appropriate, can be discharged um, at that point. We have a service called TREAT, which I will talk to you um, a little bit about. Have people heard of the TREAT service? It stands for Triage Rapid Elderly Assessment Team. So for everything we've talked about with PACE, if you like, that's about enabling people to um, move out of the hospital. TREAT is about um, helping them to, to not come in in the first place. Um, so for those patients that don't actually need to be admitted, they are triaged and assessed by a consultant geriatrician from the moment they arrive um, uh, at the front door of our hospital and then hopefully um, managed um, in a more clinically appropriate way rather than having to go through the traditional emergency pathways. We've got our MAU, Medical Assessment Unit, um, which is up on the um, eighth floor. Uh, and again, PACE take a lot of patients from our medical assessment unit. Those would be patients that might need to stay in for 24 hours for, for some continuous monitoring before they stabilise and can go home. And then we've got our base wards. The community end, we talked about either end, is what I was describing just now in terms of that multidisciplinary um, approach where we have a, a, a group of patients that are most complex, frail elderly, that are continually case managed um, to try and keep them well. So our urgent care centre, have many of you um, uh, had experiences of the urgent care centre here at the Royal Free? Well, that's good for you, I'm, 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 I'm sure. Um, so urgent care centre here is uh, co-located within our A&E department, but it's um, staffed by local GPs. So the GPs are um, all partners or salary doctors in local Camden practices. Um, and it's fully integrated within our emergency department. But there are lots of... Um, uh, patients that actually when they come in actually it's more appropriate for them to be assessed um, and treated by a primary care clinician than an emergency department doctor and that's because a lot of patients that present in A&E departments haven't suffered an accident or are not an emergency but they have some kind of urgent care need that needs to be met. How I describe this um, within the organisation in terms of the difference between a GP and a hospital doctor is a GP will assume a patient's well unless they prove otherwise, whereas a hospital doctor will assume they're ill unless they prove otherwise. And I don't mean that in a facetious way, it's just the way they're trained, you know, that, that, and that's what we would want, you know, we would want a hospital specialist to be looking to drill down to investigate everything um, uh, until they've, that they've found um, a problem. But for a large group of patients um, that come into an A&E department, probably because they can't get a GP appointment in a way that, that, that they feel responds to, to the problem that they've got in a, in a timely fashion, um, or they're just not sure where else to go in the system. Actually, the GP is the more appropriate patient, to, um, the more appropriate clinician to, to see that group of patients. So this is just another example of a piece of integrated care work that we've done. The urgent care centre here, as I say, it's fully integrated um, within our A&E department, which is pretty unique. A lot of hospitals have urgent care centres, but they're completely standalone, separate, um, separate parts of the emergency pathway. Um, it's considered as a model of best practice across London um, and is now looking to be rolled out in other hospitals, um, uh, sort of all, all over the place. A treat, which was what I just talked about. So these are just other elements of pathways that, that have patients under care, uh, which just give you an example of the integrated care approach around this. So treat, as I said, is the consultant delivered a triage rapid elderly assessment service that again sits right next door to um, the urgent care centre in our A&E department. This was just giving uh, an example in terms of uh, some of their results in the first 12 months. So they identified 800 patients. Um, so they triaged every patient over a particular age threshold. Um, they identified eight, 800 as suitable. And admissions were avoided in approximately 80% of those patients. So before treat, 100% of those patients would have been admitted um, into hospital where there would have been a more clinically appropriate place for their ongoing care needs to be managed. 50% of those patients where the admission avoided were discharged with PACE. So that's why, you know, it's really important. It goes to your point about are there adequate community services in place? Is there, you know, going to be a response that is appropriate to the patient's clinical needs? So because that wasn't there, we built it to make sure that we can be absolutely sure that the community services that are needed for our patients are, are there seven days a week when they're needed rather than, um, you know, some of the more traditional services. Again, patient satisfaction extremely high. Again, optional, so patients have the choice whether to be admitted or whether to be managed through a treat pathway. 
Um, this again is now being adopted as a model of best practice and although we funded this ourselves initially, now the commissioners do fund it because they recognise it is a, a much more clinically appropriate way uh, to manage patients in terms of their outcomes and experience of care. So I wanted to just jump quickly to a completely different example. So we were talking earlier around, um, it isn't just about long-term conditions um, or around complex frail elderly patients. So one of the very successful pathways that we have in place at the moment is a community colorectal service. Um, this is currently a Barnet service because um, it's a collaboration that we've been working with Barnet commissioners on, but we're looking and we're working with Camden um, to be able to roll it out across Camden as well. Um, so in terms of the traditional pathway, we touched on this earlier. So if you saw your GP with a problem um, that would be referred into a colorectal surgeon, so these types of things are, I don't know, hemorrhoids or um, fissures or uh, rectal bleeding or, um, you know, a, a variety of different conditions, um, you would have been referred into the hospital. You'd have been booked an outpatient appointment that you'd have probably received um, an appointment for about six weeks' time. If we manage to send you the letter rather than not sending you the letter, you're not arriving and then just sending you a DNA um, letter. We are all nodding. Yes, <laughs> I am really sorry about that. We are, we are um, sorting that out and we are improving, but I know that has been a problem um, previously in this organisation. Um, so you'd have got an appointment in about six weeks. Um, the consultant would have seen you and said you need X, Y, Z test. Um, so you might have needed a barium enema or a colonoscopy or an X-ray or an ultrasound. Um, You'd have those appointments booked separately over a period of weeks or months um, where you could be fitted in. They'd probably be on separate days, so you'd have to, if working, take that time off on separate days or as a minimum be inconvenienced to come up for, for multiple different appointments. And then you'd have been booked a follow-up appointment with that consultant where you may see the consultant or you may see their registrar, um, where you would hope all the uh, results of those investigations that have been undertaken were there. At that point, you could get a diagnosis, which actually, if you'd been worried, by the way, about rectal bleeding, you may be waiting six months before your diagnosis um, uh, under a traditional pathway to be told, hopefully, by the consultant that everything's fine, this is what's wrong with you, we're going to treat it this way, or actually, you don't need to worry about it, and, and then that's the episode of Care Finished. What we do now in the new pathway is that we have agreed with GPs and worked collaboratively with them in terms of what we would call a minimum data set. So a minimum set of information that comes into our service in a referral letter. Um, so a, a whole um, you know, clinical assessment undertaken by the GP, maybe some blood tests undertaken, but all of that information is available for when uh, the consultant receives the referral letter. Um, the consultant then triages these referrals, so reviews all of those uh, uh, referral letters to determine whether a patient would be clinically suitable for a community colorectal pathway. If they are triaged into a community colorectal pathway, which we think could be about 50% of the total colorectal referrals that come into the service could be triaged into this type of pathway, you would then be sent a letter being told that um, you'd obviously be offered a choice of when your appointment was. Waiting times for this service were about two weeks. Um, you would then be told which tests and investigations you would have undertaken when you arrived. The appointment would obviously be a lot longer, but that's okay because you'd have waited two hours in our outpatients department because the clinic was running late. Um, so um, it's a longer appointment, but actually it's within a much shorter time frame for you to, uh, to come in. Um, if you needed preparation, so for some of these types of investigations, you need to take uh, medication in advance to be prepared for those types of procedures. You'd get full information um, and the medication that you needed to be able to take in advance. If you needed assistance with that, that would be booked for you so you could have nurse support at home to help you with that uh, preparation. And then you'd arrive on the day of your appointment, you'd have your investigations in, in one go, in one place, um, and then you would see the consultant there and then with the results of all of those investigations, you'd have a diagnosis immediately an onward treat would, uh, treatment plan, and for about 75% of those patients, you can then be discharged back to the GP after that one appointment with a lot more comprehensive information than you would have had in a previous pathway. So you quite clearly see how that improves patient experience. It absolutely improves productivity because um, rather than four or five appointments for you, we're managing to do it all in one uh, place. Uh, it improves outcomes because it reduces waiting times and it also improves costs for us because we're not running all these separate clinics um, that, are, that actually you're having to, to come up to. Does that make sense? So it's been a complete collaboration with GPs in agreeing 
what GPs will do, what the hospital will do, what information needs to transfer at what time to make sure that you can make quick, efficient decisions that make sure the patient gets the right care in the right place at the right time. So this is the last slide from me, in case you're um, losing the will to live. Um, uh, the important thing to say is that integrating care is really not easy. Um, you would think it is, and actually, it's, why should patients not assume that actually we're one NHS? You know, it should be really straightforward for you to move through different parts of the system um, in a very straightforward fashion. But actually, the way the NHS has been set up, um, it's kind of created the perfect environment not to integrate care. Uh, so in terms of numerous different separate legally constituted organisations that have their own statutory accountabilities around um, quality targets, financial performance. Um, you also have different contract types. So historically in the NHS, um, the way a hospital is paid is by the number of patients they see. And the way a GP is paid is actually a block sum whether they see a patient once or whether they see them 20 times in a year, they get paid the same amount. So actually, in terms of how, you, how the money flows around the system, you have essentially created a system that means that patients move um, around into different organisations far more than is necessary. So it's not easy. Um, and, you know, that's why it just doesn't happen. It takes an awful lot of time, energy and effort to do it. But I think firmly and passionately we believe here that it's absolutely the right thing to do for our patients. And so therefore we need to force the system to work. You know, we need to design, pay, we need to design pathways and services through the eyes of our patients. Um, and then make our organisations adjust and respond accordingly, rather than more traditional models where you get the service because this is what we deliver um, and um, that's it, um, you know, which is incredibly frustrating uh, to everyone concerned. It's very frustrating to our clinicians if they're not able to deliver the optimal clinical pathway um, that they believe um, is the one that they want to be delivering. So we talked about the evidence-based thing, um, and you know that that's that's tricky for for some clinicians. You know, actually, you have to stick your neck out and say we believe this is the right thing to do. But we we put so many safeguards around that in terms of testing things. We we develop a, a high degree of clinical consensus, lots of service planning with patients um, in terms of what we think the the model. Uh, should look like, uh, and then we continue to refine it. So the PACE service, which we've talked about quite extensively, is on probably clinical model about 15. You know, we, we iterate and continue, continue to learn from which patients do well, which patients don't do quite so well, how we need to structure the service to respond to those needs. Um, and we continue to do that until we think we've got it right. So we've talked about the incentives thing just now. Um, and actually, I think we, again, believe very passionately that um, it would be really rubbish. We're all right. It's intermittent. We don't have to leave. It's going to make it even more difficult for you to hear what I'm saying. I'm sorry. It's intermittent, so it means it's somewhere else, um, not here. So we don't have to. Um, we don't have to evacuate. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll try and speak up and a bit more slowly. This is going to be great on the video. Um, <laughs> Uh, where was I? Yes, so, so we, we talked about conflicting priorities in terms of the contractual terms, but we really believe that actually that's not, that's not a credible explanation to give to patients, that we believe there's a better clinical way to deliver services, but we can't do it because of the way uh, the money flows or the way targets are set. That's just not acceptable. So, so, so we force the issue of what's the right thing to do for patients and then we make the rest of it work. And just to, to, to finish really, the amount of time and energy this takes, um, you'll know in your own home situations, uh, you know, even in a marriage, actually you can't take it for granted for one minute and it requires that constant work. It's the same with our partners. You know, we have good relationships now. That doesn't mean we would have good relationships next week if we didn't uh, behave as a responsible partner and work with them to make sure that we can work collectively to deliver the very best care for our patients. So I think that's all I was going to say. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I think the later slides were a little bit rushed. Um, I hope that's been helpful and given you a little bit of an insight into what we're up to. Um, but I'm really happy to take any questions or have any reflections or thoughts of things you'd like us to do that we, we might not be doing already.